Welcome to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. Good morning. Our first Bible reading this morning comes from the book of Judges, chapter 6. If you've got the church Bibles with you, it should be on about page 243. Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizrites. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build, build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height, Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. 
In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of, t of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jeroboam that day, saying, let Baal contend with him. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ruth, and um, I'm looking forward to reading this passage um, this morning. If you look, it's at 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, and um, that's on page 1143 of the Church Bibles. Um, so it's page 1143 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. And just a quick prayer. Thank you for Paul being honest about his fears, Lord. Um, bless Ken as he shares with us, and may your spirit speak to us through him. Amen. Everyone, good to see you. I hope you've had an excellent week and uh, looking forward to an awesome time in God's word this morning as we look at this fairly famous story. Let me ask you a question as we start. Uh, when it comes to faith, what kind of learner are you? When it comes to faith, what kind of learner are you? Perhaps a fast learner? You doubt something, then you check it out, you see its value, you adopt it, and it changes your life. A fast learner. I am the other variety of learner. The slow learner. I doubt something, I check it out, I hear, I work to understand it, I think I get it right, I adopt it, I then find out something about the way I've made my decisions that shows me that I'm a very slow learner because it hasn't changed much about, as much as I thought it would, about the way I might live my life. Well, today, friends, we look at Gideon, the fifth judge whom we meet in this wonderful, wonderful book of Judges. He, like many of us, is a slow learner. And so we need to ask for God's help as we look at this particular passage. Let me pray. Dear Lord and Father, we read in your word that you are sovereign, powerful and good. And we know in ourselves that we are often individual, selfish and proud. Right, help us to see how you lead and guide your people and show us why we should not boast in our own strength. Yet strengthen us to live in the light of your sovereign rule. Amen. Well, Gideon is a well-known Bible character. Uh, hands up if you can remember hearing about Gideon in Sunday school or in some lesson as you went through, talks along, yeah, there's quite, look at that, you can look around, you can see, uh, that's, he's a very, very well-known uh, character. How are you supposed to respond to Gideon? Is he a goodie? Is he a baddie? Uh, how are you supposed to respond uh, to Gideon. Uh, is he a champion of faith? Is he someone that you're meant to follow and, 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 and emulate? Or are we supposed to be warned by his example and stay a little bit away? Well, to work this out for ourselves, it would be helpful to follow the story as it's recorded for us in the book of Judges. 
Uh, and if you don't have uh, that already, it would be a good to have your Bibles open to Judges 6, 7 and 8, where we meet Gideon. There are Bibles at the back. Feel free to have a look in your tablets or your phones. Uh, there's a fairly detailed outline on the Sunday Hub as well, for those who like to be able to see structure and might want to go and review it at a later time. Uh, it is usually there by Sunday morning, if that is a helpful reminder. Now, we have exactly 100 verses dedicated to Gideon. Uh, now, I'm going to move fairly quickly through them, and I'm going to concentrate just on chapters 6 and 7, so that you uh, have got a bit of a direction of where we're going to go. You ready to go with chapter 6? Yes? Chapter 6. Uh, it starts with that familiar spiral that we've seen as we've worked our way through Judges. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, 6 verse 1. So God gave them over to suffer at the hands of the other nations. And here we see it is the nation of the Midianites. They were so oppressive that the Israelites took shelter in the mountain clefts and they hid in the caves, hoping that they wouldn't be seen, in verse 2. Yet for seven long years, the Midianites would invade and ruin the crops and destroy Israel's livestock, leaving them impoverished and helpless. So perhaps in exasperation, verse 6, they cry out to the Lord and the Lord sent them a prophet. The Lord sent them a prophet, verse 8. Now what good is a prophet when what Israel needed was food and proper shelter and relief from these invaders? Well, God used the prophet to tell them why they were in the predicament. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you are usually suffering for something that seems to be unexplained, the question that comes to our lips very, very quickly is why? Well, the answer to the why question is given by this prophet. The prophet reminds them in verses 8 and 10 of all that God has done for Israel and their ancestors. He saved them from Egypt. He's snatched them from slavery. He's freed them from, freed them from the oppressive uh, natures that they had under the Egyptians. And he's given them a land to live in. How did Israel respond to all of that? Well, thank you, God. That is so wonderful. It is just terrific that you've done all of that for it. No, no. Verse 10, you've not listened to me. That is what doing evil in the eyes of the Lord is. It is not listening to God. Now, it may look like evil in the eyes of the... It may not look like evil in the eyes of each particular person, but in fact, each person may feel totally justified in doing whatever they please, particularly if their reference point as to decide what is right and what is wrong is determined by their very selves. And you know that, I know that. If I want to justify anything, I will tell you why I would think this was an appropriate uh, thing to do because I want to justify why it is that I've done it. If the reference point is me, then I can do just about anything I would like to do. And so it is not evil in my eyes in any way at all. But when God looks at what I'm doing, or when God may be looking at what Israel were doing to him, there is nothing justified or good. It is evil in his eyes. And so to get the ball rolling for us when it comes to application, allow me to ask you something. What is your reference point? What is the reference point that you use when you determine something to be right or something to be wrong? As we've been looking at this passage, as I've been looking at this passage, it's caused me to ask if I'm willing to listen to God and whether I might fall into that same trap as we see here that the Israelites do. Do I accept that which it pleases myself? Do I find ways to justify that instead of try and see it from God's point of view? Well, the Lord doesn't just send a prophet. He also sends a judge. And here we meet Gideon. And what follows is a theological seesaw which bounces back and forth from the Lord to Gideon. And right through the next two chapters, we come to see that Gideon is quite a slow learner. On that outline, on the screen, you will also see God's, what, how God sets that up for us. We see God's point of view and we see the response from Gideon. So let's have a look at each as we rocket our way through. An angel of the Lord appears to Gideon where he is hiding in a wine press of all places and he's doing what, you, of course, you do in a wine press, you thresh wheat. 
and the angel makes him a promise. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Wouldn't that be great to have? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Seems funny to call Gideon a mighty warrior when he's hiding in a wine press to avoid being seen by the Midianites, but we'll come back to that one later. So Gideon pushes back, pardon me, Lord, <laughs> if, <laughs> if you were with me, <laughs> then why is everything going so badly? Where are you? Have you abandoned us and left us at the mercy of the Midianites, verse 13? How often do we assume that our problems are God's fault? Most broken relationships happen when we determine the other to be in the wrong. And it seems like we're in good company here because Gideon feels the same way. It doesn't matter that he, uh, that he and all around him have stopped listening to God. Gideon will hold God responsible for any of the burden or pain as a result of them not listening. So the Lord authorizes him to act, verse 14, go in strength you, uh, that you have and save Israel. Gideon, perhaps a little surprised that God's not given up on him, uh, starts with the excuses. Pardon me again, Lord, he says, how can I save Israel? I am the least in my family and my family is the weakest, verse 15. You see, Gideon is the fifth judge, and one thing that we should have noticed by now is that God chooses those who are most inappropriate to do His work. We've seen that so far through Judges. And actually, in fact, you don't have to go just to Judges. You could go and have a look at what's happened so far in the Bible. It's not just them. We have old, old Abraham, who becomes the father of Israel. You have self-assured Joseph. You have reluctant Moses. And looking forward you would find that you have the youngest of the family who becomes King David. And perhaps you could even find Jesus himself as the one who seems so inappropriate to do the work of God. On paper, Gideon is not the obvious choice. In fact, it's likely that Gideon was a young teenager. So those that go off to our, our crossfire group, those in year seven and eight, imagine one of those members from, from our crossfire group being asked to lead Israel into battle. Well, with Gideon, humanly speaking, there is good reason to be sceptical. And so the Lord comforts him, verse 16, I'll be with you and let me tell you what you're going to do, what we're going to do we are going to strike down all of the Midianites. Gideon's not quite there yet, he has his doubts. And so what he does is he asks for a sign, verse 17. Perhaps he's been down in the wine press a little long and it's got to his head a bit. Perhaps he's imagining himself fronting up to the elders of Israel and announcing that he will lead them in battle against this massive uh, Midianite enemy. And he pitches them looking down their nose and saying, really, you are going to lead us? And then breaking into hysterics as they think this is probably just a prank played on them as somebody comes in there assuming that they can lead all Israel. So he says, wait here, I'm going to go and prepare an offering and come back. And if you'd like to go during that period of time, be my guest, I imagine is what he's probably thinking. But in verse 18, the Lord agrees, okay, we'll go and do that if you want. Gideon goes, prepares the meal, and when he eventually returns, perhaps a little bit perturbed that the messenger is still there, he prepares the food. The angel of God touches the meat and the bread at the end of his staff, and the rock it sits on burns it up. Gideon presents a meal, and the Lord has accepted his offering. Finally, Gideon realizes that he is standing before the Lord and he hears what the Lord says. And friends, it's comforting. It's probably what would have been helpful to hear right up front, even though it was already said, but it would have been helpful. Now he hears it. It is peace. Don't be afraid. You are not going to die. And so Gideon builds an altar to the Lord and he calls the altar, the Lord is peace. And, uh, and he uh, and, uh, gives appropriate worship to what the Lord should be. 
Gideon seems to be a slow learner. When God makes a promise, He always keeps it. When God gives an instruction, it is always a good instruction. Gideon needed to listen and trust Him. So friends, when you look at Gideon, let me ask you this. Can you see yourself in Gideon in any way? Well, that night, verse 25, the Lord gives Gideon the directions to act. He's to tear down an altar to Baal and an Asheroth pole, which Gideon's dad has erected. Gideon's a little bit reluctant. He fears his family. He fears the men of the town. He goes under the cover of darkness. He's not the first person of faith who's reluctant to show his colours before his family and friends. He's not the first person of faith who's reluctant to show his his faith colours before the world. Now, what is going on in this sequence of events helps us to see that God is not into multi-faiths. You cannot have two altars standing side by side, one where sacrifices are made to Baal and the other where offerings are given to God. Australian culture may like the idea of multi-faiths, but the God of the Bible is not interested in them at all. He did not send His one and only Son to provide the one and only way to bring people to Himself, if there are, in fact, other ways that a person could gain access to God. He's not interested in pretend ways or false hopes being offered to a world whom He has done so much for. He doesn't want them to be sold a lie. So don't offer him two options when one is clearly wrong and the other one is clearly right in his eyes. His instruction to Gideon, smash up this pretend altar and hack it to pieces. You know that what uh, Gideon's name actually is Hacker? Imagine that, hanging around the schoolyard. What's your middle name? What's your nickname? I'm Hacker. Well, his job now is to hack it to pieces. It is a way that God says, I am the champion of my people, I alone, and I want what is best for them. What will follow will show that to be the case. Friends, this is a church who quite clearly and hopefully holds to a one faith view. That there is one God, who sent His one Son to die and rise so that we can go to be him, with Him in one direction. And if you happen to be visiting today, perhaps seeking or investigating what this Christian stuff is all about, I'm so glad you're here. That is wonderful. We are thrilled you're here. You need to know that we are a church that does not want to offer you many options. We don't want to tell you that there's all sorts of different ways when we know quite clearly that there is only one way. A church uh, church that goes in multiple directions is a church that walks nowhere and cannot walk as one. We unashamedly want to listen to God through His Word and hold to what it says. Predictably, in the morning, the men, of Israel, uh, the men of the town find that their old altar is now in pieces and the new altar has been erected. So they track Gideon down, it doesn't look terribly good for him. Then Gideon's dad steps up with a profound observation. If Baal was so offended by the destruction of his altar and if Baal, Baal was so powerful, why not just leave Gideon to Baal? Because clearly he'd be able to deal with him himself. The men calm down. Now, while all of this is happening, the Midianites are on the move. So, the time comes for God to empower Gideon to act, verse 34. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew his trumpet and he summoned all of the tribes together to form a makeshift army. Now, you would think by now that Gideon was getting this trust thing down pat. But no, 
Again, he needs assurance. Have I said before that Gideon is a bit of a slow learner? Okay, just in case we missed that one. Uh, Gideon says to God, verse 36, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you promised, then I will place this fleece down on the ground in the morning and there, if there is only dew uh, on, on the fleece and not on the ground, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And the next morning, that's exactly what happened. If you wanted proof that God was patient, then, then Gideon got it. Because Gideon needs more and asks, don't be angry, I want you to do this again. But this time, the other way around. This time, I want you to take that fleece and, uh, and it needs to be dry when all of the ground around is wet. And God patiently abides. God patiently, patiently bends to give Gideon the proof and encouragement that he needs. This story makes me ask myself whether I realise how patient God is with me. I don't have a fleece that I carry around with me all of the time that I can just lie down every time I want to test whether God wants me to do this or wants me to do that. Perhaps that maybe that's the way I should pr approach the way that I live out my faith. If that was the case, you'd think I was a laughing stock. But I know that I often have that unspoken wish list that's sitting there in my mind, the back of my head, of what I like to see God do in my life. And somehow I make myself believe that if those things come true, then I will have even more reason to get serious about my faith. Please don't tell me I'm the only one who does this. Sometimes by God's grace and in His patience, He gives me what I have wished for. And at other times, He knows that whatever I'm wishing for is actually not going to be that helpful at all and keeps it away. Regardless, he's there. And regardless, he asks me to trust him. I am the variable in this relationship, not him. But I'm a slow learner. Unfortunately, when it comes to things of faith, I'm often a slow learner. When it comes to things of the world, I'm often a very fast learner. In chapter 6, the quality of Gideon's faith in God is slowly raised, patiently, carefully, but that faith of Gideon's is slowly raised. In chapter 7, God equips Gideon so that he is ready to ask are ready to act. He's about to face off with the Midianites. Gideon has shown that God is not just sovereign over little things like a fleece, but over great things like the army of the Midianites. Gideon's army numbers around 32,000. The Midianite army numbers, if you look at chapter 8, around 135,000. This is this is dreadfully out of, uh, out of proportion. Let me see if I can show you the difference. If this apple represents Gideon's army, then this watermelon would demonstrate the Midianite army. That is a for formidable difference. And so God informs Gideon that he has way too many people way too many people than the Midianite army. They are hopelessly outnumbered. So he says, announce to the men, if you are trembling with fear, then turn back now. And 22,000 men leave. I wonder how many conversations went on when they got back home. Hello, dear. I'm a little bit surprised to see you. Come back so soon. Actually, I'm a little surprised to see you back at all. Two-thirds 
Two-thirds of this army is gone. 10,000 left. And God says, it's still too much. Take them down to the river and watch how they drink. Some will lap with their tongues. While the others will, will get down on their knees and drink. And choose the ones that lap with their tongues. There is nothing more holy about lapping than kneeling. I don't want you to go out to morning tea afterwards and watch for those who lap at their coffee. Oh, that's one of our holy ones at church here. It's just God's mechanism to reduce the number of men from 10,000 to 300. Gideon, the teenager, is now the proud leader of just 300 men. We don't even have a mouthful of apple left. And it's those men who will take on the Midianite army. If you like a little bit of perspective, looking at the number of people we have here, double it. And that is the size of Gideon's army. And it is going up against 135,000 armed men. Friends, your job is a big one. How does that make you feel? In chapter 6, Gideon's faith in God is slowly raised. In chapter 7, Gideon's faith in himself is quickly diminished. If you think that the key to gospel success here at Lower Mountains comes from the fact that we have 500 people in church in any one Sunday, then consider the 26,000 people that live between Lapston and Valley Heights, or the close to 1 million people living in Western Sydney. And then think about how God will often work through those who feel most ill-equipped to bring folk to Christ. It is not our efforts or efficiencies or logos or strategies or purposes or marketing, as good as they might be. It is that God is sovereign over both the little and over the big. Now Gideon is afraid, but it's time to act. So God says to him, chapter 7, verse 10, if you want more assurance, then go down to the Midianite camp and listen to what they are saying, and after that, you will be encouraged. So what's he do? He goes on down and he overhears them talking in one of the tents in, with some Midianite interpreting a dream in which Gideon wins the battle. Gideon is overjoyed. He worships God. He runs back to the camp and he announces the news. The Lord has given the camp to the Midianites, uh, the camp of the Midianites into our hands. Isn't that fantastic? Woohoo! Let's just pause there for one moment. I hope you can see what's going on here. Let's pause and see, to reflect on this one. Back in chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 12, as we've heard, God told Gideon he was with him. In verse 14 and 16, he told Gideon that he would defeat the Midianites. In verse 23, he told Gideon that he would not die. And then he did the fleece trick twice. And then in chapter 7, verse 7, and then verse 9, he says, I will give the Midianites into your hands. And he sent a prophet, and he sent an angel, and he sent the Spirit of the Lord. Eight times he has indicated very clearly to Gideon what he will do. And now Gideon, hears a dream. At the voice of the other nations. And it's the dream that convinces him. Really? Have I said before that I think that Gideon's a slow learner? Just checking. 
Well, I'm encouraged by that because, friends, I'm a slow learner as well. And I suspect quite a few here would say the same. God slowly, patiently, clearly instructs us and he expects us to listen and when we do, it's for our benefit. Well, Gideon gathers up his 300 men and in the space of just seven verses, the Midianites are routed. The men surround the camp, they blow a trumpet, they break their water jars and if you look at verse 22, the Lord causes the, caused the men throughout the Midianite camp to turn on each other with their swords. Victory. I love when Gideon, when called back in chapter 6, was addressed as the mighty warrior. And when he actually gets to the battle, all he has to do is blow on his trumpet and throw down his pottery. There is no way that Israel could take the credit for what God has just done. Now, of course, we know that that is just one of the many unlikely victories that God has won for His people as recorded in the pages of Scripture. Think of Moses against Pharaoh's army. Think of Joshua against the walls of Jericho falling at the sound of his trumpet. Think of David over Goliath. And then think of David against a whole army of the Philistines. And think of Jesus. God's best act was to defeat all wickedness, all shame, all guilt by dealing with our sin. Had it not been for the victory that Jesus won uh, when he died on the cross and then rose again, we would still be at the mercy of the world which rejects what God has done and who largely are content to do evil in the eyes of the Lord and take us with them as they go. They will call it freedom, or privilege, or right, or love, or wisdom. Sometimes they'll even call it truth. Whatever it's called, if it means not listening to God, then the Lord will call it evil. And so let me finish today by reading you a little bit of a letter written to a church in Corinth, a church that had all sorts of problems and all sorts of people and may not have been much larger than this group gathered here today. The Apostle Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it was our second reading. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message, my preaching, was not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Not wise, not persuasive words, just words by the power of the Spirit so that your faith may not rest on what we're told in the world, but might rest on God's power seen through what He says. Paul was also a slow learner, but what he got right was that he listened. And although he thought himself as weak and fearful, he felt, he, he felt ill-equipped to speak wisely or persuasively, he knew that he had to live by faith and trust that God can do what He promises and is powerful enough to work through Him. Should that not be the same for us? with whatever it is, wherever we might be, in whatever stage of life or context of life we might be today. God chooses the unimpressive, weak people like us, perhaps weak and fearful who feel ill-equipped to speak wisely or persuasively about our faith, and He promises to work through us 
often in ways that we couldn't even imagine or see or understand. And when he does, and when people do come to Christ, we should know that it's not because of how special we might be or how clever, but how powerful God is. Friends, if you're a slow learner like me, the story of Gideon may help you. It may help you because first you might recognise the importance of listening to what God has promised, listening to what He has said, and in turn focusing on what God has done, especially in what He's done for us in Jesus. We have every reason to step forward with faith and obedience Faith because of what we've heard. Faith because of what we have seen. There is every reason to step forward in faith and obedience. And friends, if you are someone who is near in faith, someone who is checking out the faith, please allow me or someone to help you take that step in faith. And for others here who may be established in faith, would you allow me through this particular story, through this amazing story, to encourage you to keep listening? Resist that urge to rest easy as if you've already arrived in faith, as if you've achieved it all, as if you, you managed to work it all out. Resist that urge. Rather, continue to read and apply what God is saying into you, your life. Perhaps, if I can be so bold, there may be secular altars that you've erected in your life, things that you've incorporated from the world and that really you bow down to in whatever context that might be, things that you know are wrong in the eyes of the Lord. You know that it's time to tear them down. Perhaps there are people around you who need to hear you playing the gospel trumpet, Whatever it might be for you, friends, perhaps it is helpful to be reminded that the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warriors. And then... Enjoy watching what God does. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Father, we have read in your word that you are sovereign, powerful and good. And we know in ourselves that we are often individuals, selfish and proud. Yet as good as we might think ourselves to be, when it comes to living for you, we often feel ill-equipped, weak and fearful. Help us, lead us, guide us in the ways that you choose and strengthen us to live in the light of your sovereign rule. In Jesus' name, Amen. You have been listening to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, get further information or download other resources please visit our website at lmap.org.au.